Well, hi there. So what I'm going to do is just spend a little time explaining to you the, the basics of what we do in piloting in supernoetics. Piloting is, is just a figure of speech. I mean, it's the official term, but it's, it's based on the idea of guiding somebody in, more like a riverboat pilot than an aircraft pilot, really. Uh, getting them directed or getting the person's attention directed into key areas of the mind which we find when we release then the person transforms and feels better and gets rid of uh, imprinted emotions and destructive behaviors and so on. Now I'm going to explain to you a model which is quite core to what happens and it's a model from hypnotism, stage hypnotism in fact. And it's something that I think almost everybody would be familiar with, even if you've never seen it live, uh, and even if you don't really believe, as it were, that it happens. Y you can see these performances on a stage. What happens is the stage hypnotist, now I'm using the word hypnotist advisedly, no hypnotherapist would ever do this, or certainly not in public, but the hypnotist puts the person under the influence and then implants a suggestion. For example, uh, he or she might say to the, the victim, for want of a better word, or the volunteer, let's say, uh, says to the volunteer, look, when, when I click my fingers and you wake up, then you'll find that this room is much too warm and you'll act accordingly. And then the person clicks their fingers, the subject wakes up, and he or she suddenly starts stripping off clothing. They're saying, oh my God, it's warm in here. It's terribly warm. I can't stand the heat. Well, of course, the audience roars with laughter because they know why this is the case. The poor victim doesn't know at all and is puzzled and probably upset and actually will probably go home that night feeling somewhat upset and then can't sleep because the bedroom is too warm and so on. These things certainly do have problems and although people get a bit of a laugh there's certainly potential dangers to this procedure. But look, I'm not trying to lecture you about the, you know, the dangers of stage hypnotism. I'm trying to explain the model. And you see, what's happened here is that using hypnotism to shut down the person's immediate conscious awareness, what happens is that they, the stage hypnotist is then able to implant ideas by getting past the mind's defense mechanisms most notably the processing by conscious mind and conscious memory. The person doesn't proceed in the normal way and deal with memory in the normal way, so it's able to be kind of slid in and works against the person in this, this rather strange way. It's a sort of implant, if you like. Now, you know, leaving aside the fact that this is rather cheesy <laughs> and whether it's true or not, I mean, let's face it, not all examples are true. They probably use a, a planted uh, assistant in the audience. But there are some people that can do it, certainly. Uh, and there are some people who are susceptible to this. That we call them suggestible. And they're people who are easily implanted in this way. Not everyone is. The point being, uh, that by overshooting the mind's defenses, we can make it do things that it, you know, that it otherwise wouldn't want to do. And the question is, you'll, I'm sure, be wanting to ask yourself, can this happen in life? Does life do things like this to us? And the answer is yes, absolutely, and resoundingly, yes, life is able to implant things in this way. That's where unpleasant emotions come from, and destructive, negative behaviors, uh, unpleasant feelings, and self-limiting beliefs, and so on. They're all slipped in, if you like, by this mechanism. It's a kind of hypnotic mechanism. There's a bit of sort of magic and abracadabra and it's sort of buried within. And then the person can't get at it and they, they don't know why this is happening to them. It's just an unpleasant behavior or an unpleasant feeling that they don't know the origins of. Now, I've got to tell you that TV advertising people know this mechanism very well. They use it and exploit it deliberately to manipulate people's thoughts and make them do things they want to do, like go out and buy a certain product. Listen, even, even news people are trying to build this sort of fantasy reality of what our society is really like, on instructions from higher up, of course, who want people subdued and controlled. 
But anyway, let's just focus on the cynical advertising part first of all. And if you watch TV ads for any length of time, you'll see very typically there's this kind of sweet, uh, gentle, hypnotic music. There's beautiful pictures of some beautiful life with uh, really anchoring emotional anchors, things like, you know, pets, cuddly pets and toys or cuddly children that really make all this safe and appealing and it shuts out the person's defensive mechanisms. So the person goes into this, oh, look at that place. And then they slip in their message, you know, buy this product now, call this number, X, Y, Z, call X, Y, Z now, or whatever the message is, whatever the call to action is that they want. I just don't want you to, to miss what's happening here. Advertisements are very cynical and they're not based on anything like clever artistic concepts. They're based upon this very serious manipulative mechanism of semi uh, inter inducing a trance in the person and then slipping in your message over and over and over by repetition. That's exactly what they do. All right, so what about life? You know, we don't go around with, uh, you know, gooey music and pictures of children in our heads necessarily. How does life operate this mechanism? Well, the answer basically is stress and overwhelm. You know, bad things happen to the person, they're freaked out, and then this stuff is implanted into the mind. Take the case of a, a woman who's uh, attacked or is feeling attacked or threatened by a man, she fears rape. She's going to go into a hyperdrive, overexcitable, overstimulated state, you know, sort of ah state, uh, in which her defense mechanisms are shut down. She moves into survival mode, if you like. Oh my God, this man is dangerous. All, all men are dangerous. Uh, oh, there's a threat here. I have to run. Panic, fear, all those emotional things that might happen. And of course, what happens is that the woman then has a problem. From then on, she becomes mistrusting. She would be very mistrusting of this particular man or anyone that looks similar to him. But you know, it gets worse by sort of spreading an extrapolation. A woman could end up feeling uncomfortable about all men. She has this mental computation going, saying all men are beasts, all men can't be trusted, all men are dangerous, you'd better avoid all men. This is a kind of cookie kind of thinking process that we call identification thinking. It was first described by Alfred Korzybski in his famous uh, General Semantics. He put it down to a simple equ equation, you know, x equals y equals z equals everything else. Things are said to be equal or the mind is calculating them as being equal where in fact they're not equal at all. Uh, you know, because one man was threatening or dangerous, of course, it does not mean that all men are dangerous, but she sort of starts to think of it that way. So it becomes a problem. Now, uh, that's kind of dramatic, you know, and maybe you think that's a bit extreme. But if you multiply it by numerous setbacks in life, like the parents are treating you unjustly, teacher being abusive, you know, peers being rotten to you, maybe bullying and attacks like that, plus a whole host of minor things like maybe, you know, a really bad dose of measles that had you in a semi-coma state for, uh, you know, for a week or more. I, I was in that sort of state when I was a youngster, for example. Uh, but even if you, you know, break a leg, it momentarily shuts down your mental defense mechanisms and so on. Really, any kind of overwhelming sensation, whether it's emotions or threats, uh, finding yourself in circumstances that you really would rather not be in, can actually operate this mechanism, get these implant things going, and then the person uh, behaves in a sort of negative or self-limiting way after that. Well, we all know it happens. I'm just explaining to you in detail how the mechanism works and the similarities, for example, between uh, what a stage hypnotist is doing or what ma manipulative uh, advertising people are trying to do. But, the, you know, life is doing it to us as well. You can multiply this up and see how complex it can get. When you, you add in scores, hundreds, maybe thousands of sort of negative events in life of maybe, you know, varying severity. Some, as I said, could be as simple as just being scolded by parents all the way to something quite extreme and quite uh, life-threatening, like, you know, lying in hospital and waiting for an operation. 
So the question is, can we deal with this? Well, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be recording this video. And we deal with it in supernoetics with a, a mechanism. Uh, we call it piloting. That's the overall thing, as I said, of guiding a person. And uh, we're, we're, what we need, of course, is a good map. We need to know where we're going, and we've got one of those. And we need, or ideally, would have a GPS guidance system so that we can't get lost. We have one of those two in the form of the uh, GSR meter, or the galvanic skin response meter, that simply alerts us to what's going on. So what we do is take the person into deeper mind space and find these buried events and process them. Uh, they, the actual negative parts, we have a technical name for those. We call them memonemes. We don't use the word implants. Or, or if we do, it means something else slightly. But, you know, memoneme is just one of these negative, charged, unpleasant memories that can be, uh, you know, as mild as a quarrel with your spouse or as severe as a near-death experience and uh, something that's uh, frightening and terrifying. Now, I should explain something before I go on, which is the nature of what I call fractal memory. Now, as far as I know, I'm the first and only person to write about fractal memory, or at least in this, uh, in this context. What I mean is that an early buried memory can sit there and is not a problem just by itself. Even if you had an unpleasant experience, what it needs is something to stir it up again. And it's this stirring up effect, or a posh word would be reiteration, that makes me think of fractals, because if, if you remember, fractals are built on a simple mathematical equation in which the answer is fed back into the initial equation, and it's fed in again and fed in again. So each time it goes around, that's called an iteration, and they, the response grows. If it's a mathematical formula, the numbers, the output grows. In terms of fractal memory, what it means is the memory is getting denser and denser and a bigger and bigger stack of things. Uh, let's say uh, this person is frightened of dogs, okay, and there's some early incident in there. Every time he or she sees a dog, there's a fear response, and that's added to the initial unpleasant experience. So there's the unpleasant experience plus the reiteration and the next reiteration and the next reiteration and the next reiteration. It doesn't really stay simple like the original memory. If it did, we probably wouldn't have nearly so much trouble with how we think and how we behave and how we feel. Unfortunately, uh, that mechanism does operate. Each, each time it recycles or reiterates, it gets more problematic, more dense. And, and so you've got to pick all of this apart, almost like you know, layer by layer, like taking away layers of the onion, or if you like, going, doing the fractal in reverse. If you remember, I said the fractal is repetition, 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 repetition. So we go backwards with repetition, repetition, but unraveling. We're traveling backwards down to the sort of, you know, the basic event, uh, what we call the root. All these things run in threads, but it, each thread somewhere at the bottom has a root. Uh, usually you don't have to go into anything dramatic like other former incarnations or past lives or anything like that. It's usually something quite simple. We don't need to get complicated. I just have to say that sometimes these things do turn up, you know. Uh, in my, uh, my former clinic facility in Manchester, for example, I'm just sh uh, sharing one with you, but this was a very sensible businessman, a millionaire. Uh, he ran a hugely successful business. He was a mason. And uh, he had back trouble, which is why he came to me. Long story short, by running backwards these iterations, he found what appeared to be a memory of being chewed by a saber-toothed tiger. He got caught and his back got chewed up, and that was pretty fundamental to his back pain. Well, it doesn't matter really whether it's true or not, or he made it up or not. What really matters is that he got well. So somewhere at the bottom of that pile of trouble and disturbance and years of reiterated backache was a memory of something unpleasant happening that was actually capable of causing backache. So you can see every time it goes round, and especially if it's not viewed and not, uh, not got rid of, then it just gets stronger and stronger, and basically that's what happens. So in solving a case, what we do is Using the GPS guidance system, we target the things that need dealing with. We go down there, uh, clear them off and remove them. And the person will experience doing that. They'll experience significant shift 
they start to see things in a, in a better way, in a new way. A person is freed, their uh, ability to function and think uh, rises. In fact, we call it negative gain. I just want to explain that term for a minute. But negative gain means feeling better because of getting rid of stuff. Okay, you don't feel better because you've now done affirmations and you're importing happiness into yourself and you're bringing in all the gratitude. It's nothing like that. You just get rid of this unpleasant thing, this unpleasant thing, this unpleasant thing. And you find down the line, 10, 20 hours, 30 hours into piloting, that you've got rid of so many unpleasant things that you feel terrific. So, uh, you know, it's, it's gain, therefore, by, neg you know, by negation or losing things. And in fact, the, the vanishment of the problems is so complete that often the person doesn't notice. You know, it's not that they had a problem and now they can see they don't have a problem. It's they had a problem, but it's gone so completely they forget about it. And it takes a friend to remark something like, oh, you know, I see you don't seem to be shy around women anymore. How are you doing? You know, and the person looks into their self, their inner world, and says, oh, wow, yeah, that's right. I used to be really nervous around women, didn't I? No, I'm, you know, I'm getting lots of dating. I feel really comfortable and, and confident. So uh, the term negative gain, I, I, I think, is a good one. Well, that's part of what we call a person's case. Now, case is the, the negativity, the unpleasant reactions, the, uh, the unpleasant emotions, the destructive behaviors and self-limiting beliefs. Uh, all those you know, non-functional thoughts, all those things about a person that the person doesn't like and probably people around him find rather difficult too. We all have a case, of course. There's no use pretending that we're special. We don't have a case. Everybody does. And in fact, the people who are worse to get on with are the people who don't recognize it. They think they're fine and it's everybody else that causes the trouble. Uh, those people are particularly difficult to deal with, as a matter of fact, because they're not looking at the truth of things. So anyway, trust me, we all have a case. And it can be dismantled actually quickly and rather easily with supernoetics piloting. It's a major major breakthrough forward. But look, it doesn't even stop there. It doesn't stop at the point where you feel better and you get relief from things that have been happening. From then on is where it really starts because as you start eliminating uh, limitations and beliefs and things like that, experiences from the past and start opening out your consciousness in full, what happens is another kind of negative gain. By dumping all that stuff, you find that you start getting back to really serious psychic abilities. All kinds of things start to happen. It's almost like magic, except that it's not magic because we understand why it's happening. So it's not magic. But what happens is that consciousness, of course, consciousness is non-material and consciousness is senior to the physical universe. Uh, you have to take that as a given. We'll explain that later. But you, you have clues, you know, if you, uh, unless you're anything but a rabidly hostile to the idea of out-of-body experiences, near-death near experiences or telepathy and so on. Uh, unless you're in a group of people that says those things can't happen, therefore they don't, uh, then you're, you're with us, okay? You're a kind of person that is aware these things happen and they need some kind of explanation. The answer is that consciousness has formidable abilities, but we're not normally able to manifest them. We're so weighed down and pressed in by limitations and negativity. But as you clear that off, then we start to recover these marvelous psychic abilities. And almost as a given, as people progress along the golden path in supernoetics, what we find is that the person starts to develop these abilities. They, suddenly one day they find themselves out, out of the body. You know, maybe it's a surprise, but it's a great start. And the, the person starts being telepathic. They know what their friend's thinking before their friend even, even telephones them. You know, these, these things grow and a person gains more abilities. And it's very exciting a bit beyond this sort of basic lecture. But just to let you know, we do go beyond this. This is, <laughs> you know, it, it might sound like just like psychotherapy or psychoanalysis or something like that. Trust me, it's way beyond that. And in the next talk, I'll, I'll go with you beyond 
that basic concept. But what's happening is that the theta being is recovering itself, if you like, uh, recovering its power and might and abilities. And in fact, that's what the whole word, the word supernoetics means, that it means more of or, or more self. Noesis or noetics is, is mind and being. So it's more of mind and being. So in other words, more yourself. And that point's worth making too that we, the person becomes more what they really are naturally. A person does not, you know, we don't all converge onto some sort of plastic robotic normal that everybody else shares and we're all alike. Quite the opposite, we go from the robotic normal, everybody's the same humanoid condition. You know, humans are all the same, they're all crazy, they're all messed up, they're all over emotional, there are one or two exceptions, but in general terms we mess up our lives more than we make them work well. So getting more of yourself really means going the other way and you become more individual, more, uh, more special, more unique, uh, more powerful, more you. So that's really what we have to offer looking you know, further down the road with supernoetics. Shedding limitations, uh, shedding unwanted beliefs. Uh, it's a rather fine journey actually and I'll unfold it in more and more detail as we go through this series of introductory talks. Okay, thanks very much for listening so far.